Welcome to our Game Business Level Up webinar series in partnership with SASTEL as our title sponsored and tonight powered by uh, SASTEL Infinite. First off, I would like to acknowledge that we are presenting to you tonight on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 territory and all the people here are beneficiaries of this peace and friendship treaty. Um, that's usually my, my first opening remarks to confirm, reaffirm our relationship with one another. So tonight coming to you uh, from Saskatoon, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm tonight's host. I'm Darcy McLean, the Executive Director of Sask Interactive. And my co-host tonight is Mr. Benjamin Schmidt, who is Head of Publishing Technology at New to Cake Studios. Um, we're tonight's co-host for um, this webinar series. And in addition, we have Mr. Ryan Hill, uh, our member services coordinator with Sask Interactive. And Brian, Ryan is hailing from our Regina office and he's gonna keep us on track. Uh, to get started, a really cool uh, webinar presented by Mr. Chris Zukowski, a Phoenix, Arizona-based freelance creative director, marketing and engagement advisor, and a content strategy consultant. Um, Chris is presenting tonight on uh, his webinar, How to Understand and Impress Your Audience with Better Marketing. Uh, it's approximately two hours in length, and um, we're going to be delivering, uh, Chris is going to be delivering a few steps on what you need to take to have a better picture and understand your audience. So looking forward to uh, Chris kicking you off here and I uh, hope we can uh, bring some insight and some expertise in your knowledge and looking forward to some good discussion. And most of all, we're looking forward to having some fun with you, Chris. Um, just on a quick note, we're gonna have a Q&A &A about halfway through Chris's webinar. And uh, we're going to have another Q&A at the end of the, the webinar for 10 to 15 minutes uh, to raise questions and, um, and Chris have some uh, answers. Uh, there will also be an opportunity to have um, uh, the, it, through the chat as well uh, for questions uh, and uh, anyone who has, uh, has that ability can go through the, the chat. So Chris, it is yours, so please take it away. All right, hey everybody, thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. Okay, let me just share my screen here. Ready to go, good? Looks good. All right, thank you so much for the introduction. I really appreciate all you coming out. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here, even virtually. I uh, really appreciate it. So um, this is my talk, How to Understand and Press Your Audience with Better Marketing. Great introduction uh, about who I am. Um, you know, when I'm a marketing consultant, basically every question I get is, is like, how do I become among us? You know, like, how do I do that? Um, and, you know, in my field and, and other folks on Twitter, everybody has a theory of why among us uh, struck it rich, did so well. It's the review curve that you see there on the right. That's pretty much how, how big they struck it. Um, and, you know, for the outside, with people looking at it, it, it just seems like a magic trick. And, and the reason, not just that they like got the rabbit out of the hat, just the fact that there's actually two sides to it. And everybody thinks they know how the magic trick works, but they don't always know. Um, you know, when you go to a magic show and you watch, you, you watch this guy go across the stage and he like lifts his like gloved hand and he like swirls it around. And you're like, ah, look at that, that swirl. And then he like plunges his hand into the hat and then he like pulls it out and there's a rabbit that he got. He just conjured it out of the hat. How did he do that? And, and you're like, I, I know how he did that. I can do it. So you, you, you go out and you, you research on the internet. You're like, ah, that is the brand of white glove that he owns. He owns that glove. I got that. Okay, I got that one off the internet. I got the exact same tuxedo as that guy with the cummerbund, same shoes, pant cut the same, got it. I, I even grew the mustache. Like I, I did everything just like this guy. And you go out, you put on the show, you walk across the stage, same pace, same number of steps. You twirl your hand above the hat. You actually throw a second one in just for good measure. And then you plunge it in and it's freaking empty. It is an empty hat and you were like WTF, Indie apocalypse, too much shovelware. Like I'm going back to be an accountant. I see this all the time. This is what happens. 
I know it, I know. Here's, here's the answer to this, guys. It was a magic trick. He doesn't, like the glove didn't actually make the, the rabbit appear. It has nothing to do with the glove. It's, it's a magic trick. Here's how he does it. There's a, there's a rabbit under the table. It's like in a bag. This is like actually how they do the, the magic trick with the rabbit. It's not the glove, but actually, you know what happens with that glove? The, the glove and the reason he swirls it above his head is that it makes your eye look at the glove so that he can have a little bit of extra give so that he can get that rabbit up and into the hat. That's the reason he swirls the thing over. And, and the reason I talk about this is a lot of stuff that you see from the outside, if you're just an audience watching this magic magician like go up on stage, there's a lot of stuff that you think is important, but it's not. There's a lot of things that are what I call this white glove that looks like it's the most important thing in the world, but it's actually not. And you know what, I actually went back, I, I was curious. I went back to the original tweet for the original announcement of Inner Sloth's Game Among Us. It has six retweets. The, the launch tweet for Inner Sloth has six retweets. And this is those things like a lot of indies think this is very important, but you're gonna see this a lot. And, and really the thing that it's the actual rabbit under the table for Inner Sloth was this thing called a daily deal that they got through Steam and then they, uh, which they partnered with Steam for, and then they actually, which built up a lot of wish lists, and then they did a discount uh, just a few weeks later for part of the summer uh, sale. This actually was the thing that really kicked it off because a streamer discovered it because they wish listed it and all this other stuff. So, but nobody really talks about the daily deal combination with the, the summer sale. Nobody really talks about it. It's because it's the secret thing that's like below the surface of the table. It's, the, it's a little trick. Marketing in indie games is full of this stuff. And so, in this talk, I'm gonna break down a lot of things that are the white glove that look like they are the most important thing that this guy did. When in actuality, it's this little rabbit in a bag is how you actually get a rabbit in the hat. So we're gonna go through all this stuff and I'm gonna show you, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, from the outside, it looks like important versus the actual thing that's important. So, um, and in this talk, understanding your audience is the rabbit bag. It is the bag under the, under the table that is so freaking important that you gotta do it. Um, so uh, the reason I say this is a lot of people will say, oh yeah, I, I have hardcore gamers or uh, my audience is just casual gamers. They, they just don't quite have that detail. And it's, I'm telling you, your audience is much more specific than that. So we're gonna do this. Um, when I show you this, this is gonna be us. We're gonna be the scientists observing them in their natural habitat, really looking at who these, these developer, these gamers are. Uh, we're gonna understand them. Um, this is me just to cut into to where we're going here. Uh, I make games, uh, my game company is Return to Adventure Mountain. I make small games for myself and I kind of crash test all this stuff. I always test it on myself before I give it to anybody else. It's like the polio vaccine. Um, and then I also run a consulting company for how to market a game. Uh, this is my game one screen platformer. It's a platformer that takes place on one screen. Um, and then I, for my consulting, I've done a whole range of uh, analysis and uh, for tons of companies, uh, uh, bigger uh, indie companies like Beta Dwarf. Um, I'm actually currently consulting with a, uh, a, um, a publisher called Big Sugar. And then also uh, so I've helped out some other smaller indie studios like Kickbox Games. And I even do some, some work with single uh, person studios. Um, and I also got a lot of this uh, user, how to understand your users, because I used to be in user experience. Uh, I used to work for the big airlines uh, studying how gate agents check people in. This is actually people working at a flight to Chicago. Uh, if people are getting ready to go to Chicago back when people used to get on airplanes. But um, I, I used to understand how, how people get on planes and what's the most optimal way of doing it and how we can speed up things for the agents so they can get people on faster. Um, those sort of things. And I bring that experience with uh, understanding your audience for video games. Um, mostly I specialize in Steam. Um, how I really studied how the, how the Steam marketplace works and, and what works and what, what doesn't. Um, and uh, I'll give a lot of examples. One of the best ones that I kind of see is like a really good studio that's doing really good work is Rift Breaker. Um, and if if you check out Simon Carlos, he's a, he used to run a lot of GDC and and kind of behind there. And he wrote some really great uh, blog posts. He does very similar <laughs> kind of work that I do. Uh, so I don't mind playing him. Uh, here's a blog post. And I'm going to give these slides so if you don't have to like scribble out this gnarly URL down here. But um, he broke down kind of the, the way that this company called Rift Breaker, this game called Rift Breaker, got 250,000 Steam wishlists. And if you've been anywhere around Steam, that's like 
a lot. 250,000 wishlists is like 10 times what most studios do. And so it's a real good case study of how games get this way. And um, kind of the key thing that they really bring out, which I think is, is key to all these games, is marketing campaigns for Steam games are very long. It's a very long, slow build, and it's all about the wishlist and how to get people to click that little add to wishlist button. And so uh, in this talk, I'm gonna be really going through all the ways that you kind of understand your audience so that you can get that, that gradual buildup of followers. So this talk's gonna be broken up into three parts, before, during, and after. Um, I'm gonna talk ways to understand your audience before you even start really developing your game, how to understand your audience during the development, the long, cold winter of building up these wish lists. And then finally, like after you launch your game, in modern days with uh, continuous development, it's no longer you launch your game and you're done with it. There's always a long period afterwards. So what to do to understand your audience after launch. So we're gonna go through all of this. Um, let's start at the beginning, of course, uh, before development and, and where you should start to understand your audience. And really what you wanna do beforehand is, is anybody gonna buy your game? That's the most important thing before development. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me as marketing consultant, like, oh, what hashtag should I use? Or should I tweet about this? Or how many emojis should I put in the subject line? Um, here's the thing is, these are all those white glove issues uh, that seem super important, but pale in comparison to the real trick, which is the old rabbit bag. Um, and the reason I say that is um, the secret to marketing is it's really four things that go into marketing. Promotion, product, place, price. If you know the marketing mix or the four Ps, You've heard of this before, but really promotion, the stuff where it's like, how many emojis should I use? That's all promotion. That's very tip of the iceberg, very top of it. But actually what matters the most are these bottom three. What this means is product place price. Product is like, I'm making a visual novel. Place is I'm making it on Steam. And then the price is like for $20. So those decisions are the most important things. Um, and I'll give you an example why it's so important, this product side. Um, I, I study Steam and the Summer Game Festival, which is this festival on Steam where people can put up a demo and then if people like it, they can wish list it and uh, just general fans. And so it's a big festival and a lot of games went out and I went out to the people who were on this, who developers, and I reached out to developers who put their game on this festival. And I just asked them, how many wish lists did you get during this festival? And then I took all the genres of all the games that I could, that shared their numbers and I averaged all the wish lists that all these different games got. And they were across all these different genres, except for VR, you'll see VR has zero. This is because I didn't find any VR games. Um, and I just graphed how many wish lists the average game got to the, um, uh, the genre. And actually I did medium too, because some big games are outliers. And here's the result. As you can see, when you look at it this way, there are certain genres that Steam players really like. And there are certain genres that Steam players just kind of, uh, and, Right there, platformer, I actually make some platformers, so I know this is true, just don't really, aren't really that attractive to Steam audience. The Steam audience has a preference. And I don't care how many emojis you stack up, there is no way you are gonna make up for that deficit if you're making a strategy game versus a platformer game. That's why I say, <laughs> it doesn't matter how many emojis you put in the subject line, it's just, it doesn't matter. You've made this decision long before. So that's why I say, the product, place, and price are the most important decision you've made before any other marketing decision. So it doesn't matter. So when should I start marketing? Marketing, which is an age old question, you've actually made the biggest decision in your marketing before you even said anything. Like as soon as you said, we're gonna make a platformer, you've, you've like locked off all these marketing decisions and you've made such a course, set such a course for yourself. So just know that it's very, very important. So, if you've made this decision, how do you understand the target market? Because it's all about what the market wants and, and they make that decision based on genre. So we could all just make strategy games, but that's not gonna work because some people don't like strategy games. Um, and there's this kind of understanding that you have to have when you go into this. Um, it's kind of this circular pie chart. So those white circle represents all possible games in the whole universe that we could ever make. But I mean, I got into games because I actually like them. So there's gonna be a series of games that I actually like to make. Um, then there's games that are you able to make. Now, you gotta be honest with yourself. I know you might like MMOs, but I'm pretty sure if you're on this call, you don't know how to make an MMO, pretty sure. Uh, so there's games that you have that skill level for. And then there's a third circle, which is 
games that the market actually wants. And when those align, that little area, there's this magic zone, which is in the middle of all three of these. Games you like, that you're able to make, and the market actually wants. Um, and it's actually kind of easy to know what games you like. I mean, you just have to soul search and figure it out. Um, the games you're able to make, this is kind of tricky because if you're brand new to making games, you might think that you could make an MMO, but I hate to break it to you, you can't. Uh, but there's other uh, quality bars that you have to be honest with yourself. Like, can I actually get that to, that, to look like that type of game or something? Um, that's a little hard to figure out. Um, but really hard is to figure out the games that the market wants. And I find so many indies don't take this to figure that out. And then I'm gonna show you how to understand this and how to understand your audience so that you can figure this out. Um, but we're gonna go through it, so let's do that. How to figure out what this red circle is of the games that the market actually wants. So <clears throat> this isn't an exact science. We're not gonna figure out down to like the percent or per the, per the cent, we're gonna get a range. We're like these type of games, like if you're gonna make a strategy game, a strategy game kind of makes between five hundred and thirty thousand dollars. You know, that's don't quote me on that. That's just out of my head. Uh, but you're gonna—that's our goal here—is just to get that high-level range. Um, and we're not looking for super detailed numbers. We're just looking at like number of commas, basically. Is this game gonna make a thousand dollars? The ten thousand dollar range, the hundred thousand, or like the ten million range? That's that's kind of the 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 scale we're looking at. Like, what's the class of game that we're looking at? And there's this guy named Danny Weinbaum. He made a game called E-Shade. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter there. And he did this really interesting article where he scraped all of Steam. Here's a link to it. And the cool thing is when he scraped it, he threw it all into a, a publicly available spreadsheet. And this spreadsheet has every single game on Steam. It sounds like a lot, like we look at the numbers and we think Steam's so huge. It only comes out to about 45,000, which sounds like a lot, but you can fit in, in, a, screen in, a, in a spreadsheet. It's not. It's not gonna like blow up your computer. Like you can use Google spreadsheets to look at it. I do that and you can have links to it. But the cool thing he did was he's, there's some ways that you can estimate sales and, and projections. And he figured out, he put a price tag of what this game is gonna make lifetime. It's estimate, but again, we're looking at thousands versus 10,000s. So this green column, he did like total possible revenue for these games. And then he also included the tax. So now we know total revenue, and what genre it is. Ah, it's really helpful. So what I did was I just filtered based on the genre that I'm thinking of making. And then I can see all the numbers. And then if you plot it against the bell curve, because all games, everything fits to a bell curve, you'll find that there's games that are shovelware that make like $0. There's games that make a decent median. That's the median game. And then there's games that are like superstars. They lined up everything. They, they roll double zeros or double snake eyes all the time. It's like the super lucky among us. So these super far outliers. So you get this nice distribution because of this data. And you can actually look at this. And if you're thinking of making a game like these sandbox builder games, like a siege game, kind of like this, you can look and say like, okay, what does the typical game that's right in the median make? Because that's the best chance of what the game's gonna make. And look at the type of quality of games. You can go through this list, this chart that I linked to, and you can see like, ah, you know what? I can make that game. That I can make that, I'm honest with myself, my team can make it, we have the skills to make a game like that. And then you look at these games that are at the A range and you're like, God, that is a really good looking game. They're running at top level. We cannot make that type of game. At least you get that little understanding of where the market is. Now you might look at some genres and you do the math and you find out like this game that looks amazing, is not even selling that great. It's like a D level game. And then this game that's like way, way, way above your skill level is only at a B level. And you're like, oh my God, this game, this genre is like way too competitive, way too outskilled. We are not gonna be able to make a game to compete there. That's kind of what you're looking at when you do this analysis is to find out where are these games. And so that's kind of the, the math that you have to do. So what I recommend is once you filter this chart out to the dollar amount and the genre, just buy some games, write it off on your taxes. You know, it's a business research. Play these games, figure out how what, what they play like, what the quality is, really trying to understand what kind of games these are. Um, and just answer that question, could my team make this game? You're going to get so much understanding out of this. And you also should look at games all along the spectrum that are in there, because you want to find games that look great. Like this game should be a, a superstar. It looks great. It kind of plays pretty good but it didn't earn very much, why? And then you do an investigation and do some research into why this game didn't earn out. 
And you're gonna find some amazing things that certain games that you look at, I mean, you're like kind of among us. I mean, not to be critical, but that game doesn't look that great. I mean, I love it, but it doesn't look that great. And you're like, why is this game so popular? It doesn't, it's not like the most beautiful game. There must be something magic inside of it. And so that's why you do that research is you kind of figure out, oh, it's, it's just because it's so fun. Like the gameplay is so perfect and the multiplayer aspects of it. That's why they did it. So you're doing that kind of research and you just play them and you see what's missing and what's not missing. Um, watch out for games is just in the research. The algorithms on Steam change a lot. So if you're looking at a game before 2018, it's kind of questionable because there weren't as many games in before 2018. They were letting in uh, fewer, it was a lot more curated. So if you're looking, if you got dollar signs in your eye and the game turns out to be from like 2010, there's probably other reasons just because the market was different back then. So I usually do my research games 2018 to now. Okay, I mean, this is, it sounds like a lot of work, but it's gonna take you a day, but it'll save you so much time because you don't wanna tr build and build a game, spend years of development on something that nobody wants on Steam. There really is a genre preference on Steam. It's, it, they don't just accept anything. So be aware of this stuff. Okay, so back to this. Um, this research really figures out the product. You're really figuring out what's good. And that's why I call this research the kind of like rabbit under the table is because it is so important. I, I can't emphasize enough. There are some games that just, they're totally high quality games, but the Steam audience just doesn't want it. And for the same reason, I mean, I talk a lot about Steam, but there's games on mobile. Um, the no cake guys know this, that, you know, it's just not the right genre for mobile. The mobile audience is different. And so there's all these different things that you have to really research to figure out. You just can't put any product and hope that it sells just because it's high quality. It really has to fit the marketplace. And I can't emphasize it. This is the rabbit. This is the real reason for the magic trick. Okay. So when you're doing these pitches, and I know Jason's on the call. Thank you so much. Being super fan number one, Jason. Um, he's always about pitching and you have to have your budget. You don't want to go in if they're asking you like, oh, so what are your sales goals? What do you expect to earn? You don't want to just go in and saying we're going to make Minecraft money, right? <laughs> like, I know, I hope to make Minecraft money, but let's be honest. But when you do this research and you've kind of looked at a bunch of games and you can kind of see that range, like, I think we could target the quality level of games that earn in the like 100 to 25, 250K range, you know, somewhere in that range, you'll at least have that range in the back of your head and you're going to sound much more intelligent. So you don't just go in and say, oh, we want to make Minecraft money. That's, that's, that's the goal here is just to have a little bit more education. Um, you know, I've, I, I did further research on this. I took that Danny Weinbaum chart and I went through and I counted up how many games in each one of these genres there are. Like how many 4X, how many building, how many RPGs, how many RTSs. These are the number of games with this tag on Steam. As you can see, the market has tons and tons of puzzle platformers, a lot of visual novels. And then there's like a very few of these very select genres. And I, I pulled some key genres because I knew there a lot of indies kind of like them. Like Souls Like, there aren't actually that many Souls Likes. But then I had the idea because I have the sales estimates, I could graph it against how many uh, sales these different genres. And I did a median on this. So this is the medium number of sales in the red line. This is median earnings for these games. As you can see, it's almost like a perfect sales, if you, if you know supply and demand. It's almost a perfect example of it. There's tons of puzzle platformers they don't make that much money, but there's a real gap, like Souls-like, uh, CRPGs, 4X. These are genres that have a, a very big hunger. There's a lot of people that are willing to pay really good money for them, but there's kind of a gap in the marketplace. Now, this is a very blunt, blunt tool that I've looked at, and you can do much more detailed research into this because there's subgenres and subgenres in here. But just from a glance, you can see Again, I'm not, this is definitely rabbit under the tables territory here. There are definite genres that don't earn much, but there's a lot of competition out there. So really go in and, and find out what you like to make and what actually is selling. So um, really, when you're looking at how to understand your audience, the first step is really to uh, understand the types of games that they want. And I know, I don't, I, you know, it's kind of hard to break it to people sometimes. I mean, if, you, if you're an indie who really is trying to do this as an art form or something, you know, you could say, don't, don't market test my art, man. Uh, I'm just trying to make a game that's my soul, man. And I, that's totally, like, I, I really look, for, look forward to playing your game. But the main thing is not to tell you to just not stop making your platformers. It's really just to give you the guidance that, so that you know the risk. Like, 
if you are making a puzzle platformer, don't mortgage your house or try and live on a boat or something, you know, like you really have to uh, account for your risk factor here. So if it's, if you are making a puzzle platformer, don't, don't go crazy with it. Keep the time, the amount of time you spend on it short, don't invest too much money in it. it really, you gotta understand the risk factors. And that's really why I, I recommend this. I, I'm not trying to convince us all just to make strategy games and that's all we ever make anymore. It's just to kind of have that risk profile. Okay, um, if you're saying, hey, I, we're a year and $300,000 invested in our puzzle platform, what do we do? Um, you know, if you've already made that decision, what I would say is, you know, figure out what you could cut, <laughs> you know, understand based on the sales, kind of where things are going and what you should do if you want to keep going or if you want to just put it out, just figure out how much more you want to invest in this, which might not pay out. So that's kind of what I recommend you do. Okay, next step. Um, so if you are doing puzzle game, you know, gotta love you up. It just just know the risk factors here. Okay, so that's before development. Um, once you get into development, you still have to understand your audience. It's not too late. I mean, you're you've got you've got it there, um, but you've got to figure out what people want to hear about, and then we got to how to get the word out for you. And those are kind of two things that I want to talk about during this during development phase. Okay, okay. So uh, this is the chart from the uh, that game Rift Breaker, which is just killing it on Steam. They really know what they're doing. They, these guys are really, really killing it. Now, if you look at any graph, you'll notice there's these spikes, but there's also this kind of baseline. There's a lot of gaps of time where you're not doing a major promotion. You didn't get featured by some Chinese influencer or something. Um, and there's just periods where you've got kind of like nothing really going on. It's just kind of this baseline. That is a very important time uh, where you're, you should still focus on your marketing, even if you're not doing these big promotions. And what's really important here is not what big deals you're working out. It's really just like what people want to see because people will be visiting your page and deciding, should I click add to wish list or not? And if you get this messaging right, you're kind of like long tail, what they call long tail, or this kind of in-between period will be higher at a higher level than some people, like if your page isn't optimized. Let me, let me show you specifically what I mean. So I, I, I know doing this and, and writing this weekly blog that I do, I, a lot of people come out to me with their numbers. And there were two games that were actually pretty similar. One's called Lo-Fi Ping Pong, the other one's called Omen X. Um, and they had almost the exact same like exposure. Now, if you browse Steam, you'll see all these little icons for different games. That's called an impression in Steam parlance. And these games were, if you look, that's 35,000 views per week. These are weekly numbers, seven days. Um, and the third, the other one was getting about 32,000. So these are two games that are like um, right at the same level of exposure. Like Steam is exposing them at the same level. But if you look at how many people actually click that, because Steam tells you all these stats, these two games have different percentages for the number of people who see the icon and say, oh, I want that game. They click on it and then it comes to a page and then they have that wish list button and then they go, oh, I'd like this game, wish list. Those are like three different steps. And as you can see, lo-fi ping pong, about 9% of people, about 10%, uh, if you round up, will see that icon and click it. Whereas Omen Exito has about 6.7% of people will say, oh, I like that icon, I'll click it. That sounds pretty close, like 3, 3%, that's what, 3%. And then same thing when they look at the page, 4.7 for lo-fi will click the wishlist button versus Omen Exito has 2.7. That doesn't sound like that much. Again, 2%, 3%, you know, what's the matter? It, it, it amplifies over the years. Like if I extrapolated the data, if they kept that steady, this is a difference of 8,372 wish lists for Lo-Fi Ping Pong versus 3,000 for Omen Exito. It adds up these small percentages. So you really have to optimize your page. Like, and this is no, has nothing to do with about tweeting or anything else. It's just the baseline description of your game that affects this. So it's very important to get that baseline up. <laughs> and so a lot of people ask, well, what do you do to get them to click that wish list button? And it's not some sleazy con. It's not like you're tricking them into wish listing it. Really what you're doing is you're just figuring out what they want and you're telling them. I know it sounds so stupid, but that's all you gotta do. The hard part is figuring out what they wanna hear. And I'm gonna tell you. Okay, so 
I'm sure if you've got an office, you, you all sit around and you're like, well, and there's always this guy, he's the guy wearing the jacket. It's always that guy in the beard and the jacket. And he says, well, if I were the user, this is what I would do. Or I know when I look for games, this is what I want. Now, everybody has an opinion, they're entitled to it, but all of us on this call, everybody I'm, I'm seeing in the chat, we are not the typical Steam consumer. We are, we are weird. Listen, here it is, it's a nighttime, it's a, what? What is it, Thursday, Wednesday night? What night is it? It's a Thursday night. You can be playing video games right now. You guys could be playing with your friends, playing among us. What are you doing listening to me? You are just by listening to me on this nice night, you are not the typical Steam consumer because a typical Steam consumer would actually be playing video games right now. So understand at that gut level, you have no idea what the typical person wants. We are we are we are tainted. So just to know that we're not typical. And so here's how you actually understand what a typical player will want. And we're gonna do two things. One's called review analysis and two is play testing. We're gonna start with review analysis. So um, the thing is, as game developers versus fans, fans play a lot more games than we do because we take so much time playing games or making games, we don't have time to play them all. And our review analysis will really understand what they like and don't like about a game. And this kind of goes to this old marketing truism where it says, if you can state the problem better than they can, they will trust you. That's how you get people to buy something. And you might say, well, these are video games. What kind of problems do people have? And we are in the dream business. Like we're not solving problems here. But if you've ever read Steam reviews, you know that people have a lot of problems with games. <laughs> There's tons of problems. Look at all those hearts are swear words that Steam censors for us. So people have tons of problems with video games. So all we do is, Remember that analysis where we looked at the bell curve and we looked at games that were underperforming and underperforming? Just go into those games reviews and look at them and just kind of do an analysis there. You can pull up charts for all the reviews that a game has done ever in Steam. You can look it up right here. And really what we're looking for are a couple things. One I call genre fault lines. And these are, um, I'll explain it, but it's what dif differentiates a game to be one genre versus the other. I find a lot of problems happen to you and gamers don't, game developers don't understand what genre their game is. It's, it's strong, strange, but a lot of developers don't know that. Uh, genre conventions, uh, a lot of developers also don't know the tr kind of the, the tropes of the genre. And when you violate those, it's a big no-no. Um, and then also just to look at the phrases that people use. That's what we want to do in this review analysis. So here's an example of a genre fault line. I looked at this game that had kind of negative reviews. And I was like, this game looks great. What's the problem? This review, this is a review, actual words from a player. He said, I was thinking this is a fun open world farm simulator, but it's really just a simple survival game. Now me, I don't know this genre well enough. Those kind of sound the same thing, like open world farm simulator versus survival. I grow a farm to survive. I don't know, they sound the same, but to, I saw this kind of comment over and over again. This is what I mean, a genre fault line. To fans of this genre, that's a big deal. And it's okay to make an open world farm simulator and it's okay to make a survival game. It's just make sure your marketing is right on whatever side it is. And obviously this developer who made this game didn't know that difference. And so that's why you really have to understand what genre and what type of game you're making. Genre conventions, if you don't know your genre well enough, you can step in it and violate some golden trap that, that happens here. Here's, here's the review comments for a game. These are all different reviews, but for the same game. Listen, allow me to skip through dialogue. You have to wait through the dialogue again. Frustrating that there's no option to skip or fetch for a dialogue that you've already seen. Like, okay, obviously this is a visual novel and they've obviously missed this very key fact that you need and your fans expect to be able to fast forward through dialogue. So if you're developing a game, make sure you get that fast forward button in your game. Um, also a cool thing to do, and this is for your marketing, is just to see the words that people use. These are two different reviews for the same game. And you say, you don't really know how much you learn about history from this game until you take a college class and you know what the professor's talking about. Totally separate view. The guy said, hey, you find yourself answering questions about geography and history with ease. Like, obviously these people enjoy, this is for a, a strategy world simulator game, a world history simulator. They really enjoy real life facts. They like learning history through these games. They think it's a really neat thing. So make sure that that's reflected in your marketing. So what I typically do is when I'm doing this review analysis, I just open a spreadsheet and I have a column of things that people hate about this genre and things people love about it. And I just pull quotes, like I'll just pull the actual text because that will really help when I'm doing my marketing. And guess what? All of this text turns into very easy copy for your marketing. 
So for example, here, let me show you. If we were making that, that uh, uh, visual novel that has a skip button and we added a skip button, if it actually had it, we would just say, hey, you could skip di dialogue you've already seen. Like put that in your marketing because you know people are asking and worrying about that. If you're doing a history strategy game, just put those two guys who are talking about a history class. Say a game so accurate you could pass a high school world history class without studying. That sounds like a pretty cool marketing thing. That's a good marketing quote that you could put in there. And it, it's not like I was really creative in coming up with that. It's just because I knew what the audience was looking for. And you get that by looking at a lot of reviews. Um, here's a warning sign, leave your designers alone. If you're the marketing guy and you're a designer and she's like, leave me alone. Leave if you read like a bunch of reviews that say like, I like characters with blue shirts. Don't go to your design team and say, please, please put in blue shirts. They love it. Leave your design team alone. They should be the creative force behind this. But what I'm saying is make sure that you know what to pull forward as a cool feature like skippable buttons. Um, you might want to tell your design team to include a skip button if you're making a visual novel, just a tip. But uh, again, let the, the creative process happen kind of outside of marketing. Okay, second one is play testing. This is a very, very important thing. So back in the day, we used to play test or indies used to play test at big conventions. That used to happen. I actually didn't think that was a good thing. And I don't know why indies thought that play testing during a convention. I think it had to do with this movie, Indie Game the Movie, if you've ever seen it. There was this very pivotal scene where this poor man was trying to show his game at a show, but he was also trying to play test it. And he just got so incredibly, like severely mentally hurt from this experience. And so I think a lot of indies took, watched this movie and said, oh, that's how I do it. And they took this. And this is actually not a good idea. I'll show you why. Why you should not play test during a convention. So one, conventions are so damn expensive. They're thousands and thousands of dollars. If you live somewhere else and you have to fly and hotel and booking space and flying all this equipment, it's so damn expensive. You can do a very good play test for like under $400. It's depending if you're gonna pay people to do it. Like it could cost you zero dollars to do this that I'm gonna tell you. You don't have to do it during a convention. Two, on a show floor, it's impossible to have a, a neutral controlled test. Um, I went to, to Sony's playtest facility. This is what it looks like. As you can see, it's like white room. There is no like Sony tchotchkes. You don't, need, they don't, you don't even see that it's a PlayStation. They hide it inside the cabinet so as to not influence the playtesters. There's no like play, posters of Kratos or something. It is like white room, looks like a living room, so neutral. They don't even have people watching you next to you. They hide behind a one-way glass. They're actually, you know, like on that scene in Batman, but they don't like throw the Joker up against the glass, but they're sitting on the other side of this glass. So then it's not to like influence the people playing. It's like so sterile, neutral. And then if you look at a play test in a, like a show floor, look at this, it is nuts. Like the logos here, you've got people wearing PlayStation gear. There's like a big screen advertising this thing, you are not going to get a neutral play test out of people if you're doing it on a show floor. It is a cacophonous, crazy hellscape here. Don't play test on a show floor. Okay, the third reason you shouldn't play test on a show floor is that you're simultaneously being like a scientist trying to observe a person in their natural habitat and also trying to be a salesman. You can't be both at the same time. It's impossible. So what I say is drop the scientist bit and just be a total sellout and just like sell, sell, sell. Like get out there on the show floor. Like seriously, sell on the show floor. Don't try and run a research project. Okay, here is how to actually do a play test cheaply and without all this negative baggage of being at a show floor. Um, we could do it all the time. Like it, we didn't have to wait for a pandemic to hit. We could have just done this like a year ago. Don't worry about it. So here's what you do. Just reach out to your community reach out to Reddit, you could do a Facebook ad, something, just get people. And a lot of people think, oh, I've got to have like eye tracking and all this stuff. I was a UX designer researcher for like a decade. I did one eye test where I was like eye tracking one time. You don't have to like have the best play test ever. You just have to like get in a quiet space with these people and watch them. So don't think that it has to be perfect. It could be simple. All you do is like go on Discord. Discord has a very good screen share. You can even do a Zoom like we are. Just ask the person to share their screen, give them a key for your game and just watch them. Um, just watch what they do. Um, 
a lot of people wonder what they should tell these playtesters. What I do is I typically give them my sales copy and say, you know, you don't want to tell too much about the game because you might influence them. I just give them my sales copy, maybe give them the Steam page to read. Um, and then I just kind of let them do that. You might, another good thing is don't code up your tutorial ahead of the play test because you're going to learn so much about what people understand and what they don't understand. So typically, instead of coding up a whole tutorial system, I will just sort of um, read them what I would have done in a tutorial, like said, oh, uh, click this first, that sort of thing. Like be the human play test tutorial. That's kind of a good tip. And then what you do is you tell them to talk aloud because while they're playing, you can't really tell what's going on in their brain. You just have to watch what's happening. And so um, because we can't look in there, we have to have them talk out loud. So I always tell my participants, say everything that you're thinking because you don't know why they made the decision that they did. And a lot of nowadays people will say, oh, you mean like a let's play? And say, yes, that's exactly what I want you to do. Be the, pretend you're doing a let's play. And so that's a very common per, uh, habit for people to do nowadays that wasn't so common and used to be. Um, and then just shut up. The worst thing is <laughs> people talk way too much um, when they're running the play test. So um, a lot of people ask, uh, is this what I should be doing? Is this where I should go? Don't answer that question. I always answer that back with a question and say, so what do you think you should be doing? And because you don't want to influence them while they're doing the test. And if they say, so do you want me to build a castle? You say, what makes you think that? You just ask the question back at them so that you can hear what they're thinking. Because if you answer it, then you've, you've tainted them. You've told them what they should be doing. And then after the end of the play test, just ask, based on what you've played, did the game match the trailer or the Steam page or whatever you've read about the game? And that's just a good way to kind of figure out, am I saying the right message? Remember those genre fault lines where there was that game where it was like, oh, I thought I was playing this type of game, but it's actually this type of game. This is how you're, you're sussing that out to make sure your marketing is on target. And then have somebody else on your team take notes. Uh, you want to hear key phrases like, oh, you know what? This game's like the Big Lebowski Cross with Civil 2. Like if that was a game, that'd be pretty awesome. But you can't, if you're trying to proctor this test and guide them through, there's no way that you can take all these notes. So have somebody else listening and taking notes of these cool phrases that you can use in your marketing. Okay. Small sample size, it doesn't have to be a huge test. You can do like nine, seven people. You usually start to hear the same stuff over and over again. So it's a good sign. Okay, um, this is halftime. Questions? All right, on Chris. Good job so far. All right, everyone. We're um, going to take some questions in, uh, for, for Chris here. Uh, we've got one in our box here, uh, Chris. Any sense of why supply versus demand of genres is so off the mark? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why everybody makes a platformer. I think it's, I mean, this is what's awesome. I see this big opportunity because if everybody's making the same type of game, I mean, I, I think a lot of people, okay, those games that were on the very far end that were very small, those are actually very hard games to make. They're very complex mm -hmm. games. Platformers are relatively easy to make. Um, and so a lot of people make their first game as a platformer and it doesn't sell well because there's so many platformers and nobody's really looking for platformers. And they see that, they try that experiment and they're like, oh, indie games are so hard. Let me get out of it. Forget it. When really it's like, okay, that was your first step. Just if you kept going and you kept playing, uh, you kept making games, you're going to get more and more of an audience and you're going to learn and you're gonna, your development's going to get better and better and you can make these more complex games. So I think that's part of it is the complexity of the games. But here's a chance for some of that um, filling a market need is to, and that cool indie spirit where we like uh, make things that people don't understand. Like this is an opportunity I see that the indies could really capture, which is to look at these genres that used to be so big, you know, like 4X is a big genre and be so smart and indie like we are, we are really, we shattered expectations. Figure out how to make a very simple, small 4X game. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in figuring these needs that can be done at the scale of an indie. So I think that's where innovation could really happen, whereas people are trying to innovate on a very well-trodden area, which is platformers. So that's one hunch I have. Okay. Cool. Uh, we got one from Jack here. Uh, are there any major differences between the marketing of a mobile game and a game on Steam? A lot, a lot. <laughs> um, mobile games, like I, I actually released a couple games on mobile and I moved to Steam for a couple of reasons. One of the things is, I think the biggest difference that I know is on mobile, 
people aren't fans of games outside of playing them. What I mean by that is they don't read extra press. They don't look at trailers. They don't watch YouTubers. Really, like if you look at the number of um, mobile YouTubers, it's like a handful. And I literally mean that's like five <laughs> or fewer people that actively play mobile games on like Twitch or something. And that's just because the audience who plays mobile games are very casual. They just, they will literally pick up the phone and whatever's at the top of the app store, they'll play that game and nothing else. They don't go in and investigate all these games. And so you just have to be like on the front of the, theme, uh, of, on the, front of the app store or you have to use ad buys to get in there. And I don't know the, app, the mobile market very well, but what I do know is that it's, it's, there's not much research going outside of it. Whereas the Steam and PC audience and, and to the same extent, um, uh, the consoles, those are, they're fans of video games. So they're reading all the press, they're, they actually are on Twitter, Twitter re researching, they watch trailers, they play with their friends a lot and learn that way. So there's just a much bigger fan community. So there's another, it's an easier to market that way versus just on the mobile side where you just have to be front of store. Mm -hmm. And there is niches out there. I just, coming from a mobile yes. company, Listen there's guy. niches out there you can find. Um, but you know, it, it is a lot different, especially if you're going for those chart topping games. Uh, that's just a whole other beast that's pretty unrelated from this even. Uh, but uh, there is ways to, to market your game out there, uh, but it's, it's hard. It's, it is a lot more to do with, um, you know, getting the featuring that you want from the stores and stuff, so. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, there's another one here. What are your thoughts, Chris, on advertising with streamers and streaming platforms? Question. Uh, you mentioned Steam and your focus. Do you have any thoughts on the Steam live streaming? Um, by Steam live streaming, I assume you mean like if because you can stream to your page and you can get um, you can play your game on Steam. Is that is that what the questioner is asking about? Yeah. Uh, let me just see here. Uh, what are your thoughts on advertising with streamers and streaming platforms? Well, I'll answer that question first and then yep. clarify what you mean by the Steam Life. Now, um, yes, it, you can, and I've seen some success with paying for streamers, but you have to have a, a bit of a budget and you're ready to spend on it. And what I find is I have worked um, with the publisher Big Sugar um, we've, we have done some research on streamers and paying for it. And what we find is <clears throat> you kind of have to find this middle tier of streamer, like the very, very most expensive streamers, like I, I don't even know the top ones, but if you pay for them, they're really high budget and they don't actually, most of the people who are watching them are actually watching for their personality. They don't care about the, the games. And then the very low tier streamers, the ones that you can pick, like you can get your game played by them for like 50 bucks. Like you pay 50 bucks, they play it. And it's for like a hundred people. Surprisingly, those it they, you will get some wish lists from out of that, um, mm -hmm. but the kind of sweet spot is right in the middle. And typically, it's like in a five hundred to a thousand dollars per play session range to pay for that. Um, and you have to have a really good call to action to say, "Oh, we're running a beta, so go play the beta," or go wish list it now. You have to make sure they're a good streamer. And it's kind of a crapshoot. Like sometimes you'll pay for a five hundred dollars streamer and it doesn't work very well, and then sometimes you pay for it and then it does well, but it's very pay to play and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, you just have to have a lot of money that you're willing to like chance it. Again, uh, when I talk about the odds, <laughs> you know, I don't, I mean, like if you've got a platform you're trying to make money on, you know, you're going to be spending a lot and it's, it might not be worth it. It might not be worth the opportunity cost for that. So that's kind of my thoughts on streaming. And did you clarify what you meant by the steaming, the stream live on stream? Theme. No, I'll just reread it here. Uh, you mentioned stream is your focus. Do you have some thoughts on the stream live streaming? S Steam live streaming. I think if it is where you can like, so there's a feature on Steam where you can play your game or you can get somebody to play their game on Steam. And then on the top, when you go to your store page, you're there. I have been on the front page of Steam for my own game. And I know a couple other people that I mentor who have done it as well. And that's really powerful. The trick though is you do that during a show that you get yourself into. So you apply maybe like the way I did it was my, I use a tool called Game Maker. I was, I got in with the Game Maker folks and I got my game featured on a Game Maker sale. 
And so there were already, because of that, a bunch of people looking at my page. Then I, I did a live stream and then I got enough people like that, that I got to the front page of Steam. That was very helpful. If you're just doing it on a regular day, and I've noticed I, that uh, game Rift Breaker that's doing so well, they, even if they do it on just a regular Wednesday or some day, it doesn't really do that much. But when they target it for a show that they're featured in, then they get to the top of the page. So it, you have to time it and be already part of another uh, promotion on top of it. Uh, cool, we got, we got one more. Uh, I just adding to that real quick. I know like that's true. Um, Nuts, one of the games that we're working with, they did a, a one of those streams during the autumn sale, the autumn festival, and it did really well for them. So, yeah, like the guy, uh, the guy that I kind of mentored, he did a stream that he got his game on the front page and he sold more in that kind of weekend when he was streaming than he had like all the way up to that day, yeah. like mm -hmm. made for his game. So it's really powerful if you get there, but it's hard to get on the front page. It's not a guarantee. It's not like you just flip a switch and be on the front page. Yeah. Okay, here's one more um, from Cedric. Uh, is there somewhere where we can find documentation on how to coordinate um, all of these activities into a, a strategic plan? Um, like. I guess some resources to to coordinate kind of every way, everything you're saying. <laughs> well, I, it's good that you ask. How to market a game.com. You can join my newsletter. I write a I write a blog post on this kind of stuff every week. Um, and you can see an archive of all my stuff. Um, that's probably the best bet to kind of weave it all together is to kind of have all <laughs> these things in one central place. How to market a game.com. Okay. And on um, any. Any advice for VR marketing? Oh, I don't know. VR is a rough one. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I just got an Oculus Quest, by the way, and I'm like, man, this is so fun. Like, it is right on. VR is really fun. Like, I'm playing through Half Life Alex. It's neat. I get it, but um, I don't think everybody's gotten religion on that. And I don't <laughs> know. I don't know how to market VR. Uh, in all my research, oh, nice. Oh, look he's, at Ben. <laughs> he's going into the Netherverse or whatever. So. Um, no, I don't. I, I haven't consulted for a VR game. Again, this is a good time to okay. go talk to your audience, figure out how they uh, look for games, figure out what's going on in the VR audience. Um, but it, mm. I gotta tell you, it is an uphill battle. Um, in my Steam research that I've done in the past, VR games are just, it's hard. It's, it's a very niche market, uh, but there's opportunities because people, I, I spent so much on games when I first got that Oculus. I was like, I wanna try this game, I wanna try this game. So I think <laughs> they, they have money. People who have VR have money. So they're willing to spend a little bit more, um, but you just have to get into that. So my bad, mm -hmm. my my recommendation is just research the, the audience there. Good point. Okay. Okay, we got one more from uh, number one, Chris Zukowski, super fan, Jason Del Roca. Um, Thank you, Jason. Have you come across many indies willing to do the needed product uh, research, like genre tags, competitive game quality, can we build it, etc. Or is that why you're busy and why you're a busy consultant? Like, <laughs> it is hard to find. And uh, usually they, uh, I'd love it if they just listened to me. I mean, that's that's the gold standard. Uh, no, it's, it's hard. I try and do it now before people do it because once they start making the game, they're kind of like on the tracks and then sunk cost fallacy gets set into its ways and people don't want to change. So it is hard. Uh, that's why I, I say it. Nobody calls me in to say, hey, can you just tell me what game to make? That's, I wish <laughs> I could find that. Um, but I, that's why I expect these type of talks, these type of articles to get people to do it. And it's usually, um, I find these things kind of happen the second game. So the first game is like, that's your dream game that you want to make. You make it, maybe it doesn't sell as well. Then you're like, okay, what do we do right this time? And that's more when I expect to be be called. So, but still, I've never been paid to t do market research because everybody has their dream game inside of them. So, true enough. Uh, one more here uh, that I uh, then we'll get into your part two. Uh, you mentioned early on that wish lists are the most important thing. Is there an expected con uh, conversion rate for wish lists that can be used to expropriate expected sales? Yeah, and that's a hard one. And and it's kind of, I I know some games uh, get, I've heard of games that actually get 100% conversion. And it's not that all the people who wishlisted it converted. It's just the game had a big hit and then more people bought it who saw it on day one and were like, oh, that's a neat game. And then they bought it. Um, it kind of depends on the genre and the game. Some people say it's like 30% within your first week is will convert. 
And that's not 100% conversion. It's just, let's say you go in to your sales with 10,000 wish lists. Um, mm -hmm. Then whatever, a third of that, like 30,000 will buy it. And that's just because some people see it on the front page and like, oh, that's neat. The more important thing I'd say, like a lot of, sometimes people buy wish lists in the form of like getting advertising or deals to get wish lists. And sometimes that gets low quality wish lists. That's why I say it kind of depends. But if it's truly organic people who are like interested in the game, they'll convert at a higher rate than people who maybe were bought into it because of some promotion or something. Um, the more important number is kind of like, like what Steam has as far as the numbers. Like there's a certain widget when you're getting ready to launch, I would not try and launch without 10,000 wish lists. Um, things on Steam start to put you in the favorable category. There's a, the algorithm just likes games that have 10,000 wish lists. There's just there's a lot of complicated things that I want to get into, but it just seems like when you have about 10,000 wish lists, Steam treats you better than those games that launch with fewer than that. That's mm -hmm. not to say that you couldn't do other things, but I try and tell everybody to get at least 10,000 wish lists. Interesting. Okay, Chris, uh, there's no other questions there. And okay. I think we've uh, uh, gave you all of them. So uh, the floor Let's... is yours again, uh, take it away. Okay, good. I'll, I'll make a lot more questions based on the next step. Okay, so we talked about the baseline. Um, you know, you're in the development process and we wanna try and get that baseline flat line up. But let's talk about these kind of peaks. Um, because everybody loves the peaks. That's why this guy, this analysis points out all the red lines and stuff like that. Um, so how do you get the word? How do you get it? Again, back to the thing. Every time I ask indie that come to me and say, like, can I get some advice? I say, what have you done? They always say, I tweeted about my game and I contacted the press. And that's white glove stuff. Um, if you look, so what I did was I went through this game, Rift Breaker, everything they've done. These guys got 250,000 wish lists, which is like an ungodly amount. So I looked at all their peaks and what they said they did to get to that peak. And I looked to see like, uh, what were they? These are the number that were press. Two of those peaks came from press. They were a Euro Gamer preview and a PC Gamer. It wasn't that much. That, that really wasn't an important aspect to press into their, their peaks. Um, also, Twitter was none of them. They never like did something awesome in Twitter and then they got to this. The majority of their stuff came from these. These are like Steam Daily Deals, Steam Summer Festivals, Gamescom, something called a Tower Defense Sale on Steam, PAX, PAX East. If you look, all of these are kind of what I call biz dev. In other words, they made a deal with Steam or they made a deal with like um, Gamescom, like they bought their placement on the pay on um, they, in this festival or PAX as a festival. In other words, they applied for their game or they did a little sales pressure. And then somebody said, yeah, you're in. We'll, we'll include your game in this. It's biz dev. And I think biz dev is the missing rabbit under the table that indies just aren't doing enough of. It's really that business relationship and in getting into these, these deals. So I'm going to talk about these. Um, like I said, white glove stuff, This these kind of, I tweeted about my game. So these are the kind of festivals. So this is one called Digital Dragons. And so the thing about these, uh, since COVID, which is like one of the only good thing out of this is Steam has opened up the gates to these festivals. So like Digital Dragons is a festival in Poland. I think it's out of Krakow, Poland. Um, they will, Steam will give them prime location on Steam when you go to Steam and it's all the games that are in that festival. And the reason it's so powerful is that when they look at these games and like people come to this page and they're like, oh, that looks great. They can wishlist it right there. There's no extra clicks. There's no extra websites they have to bounce around. It's just right there. So these festivals, since the COVID time, since they're not happening live, where they get featured in Steam are super powerful. Very, very good. Um, there's other things like think outside of other corporations like AT&T. I just saw this just this week. AT&T has something called Unlock Games where they're trying to elevate women in game development. You can apply for your game to be in this. These sort of like, Intel does this, AMD does this, reach out to these companies that are kind of video game adjacent and see if they're doing any featuring or anything like that, reach out to them. These, these people, like we're just these little sucker fish underneath this giant shark that is these giant corporations. And that's, you wanna be those little sucker fish, just suck onto the bottom of AT&T as they swim through and churn up the ocean. That's what you wanna do. So what I say is reach out to these big companies like Intel, 
AMD, see if they're, or whatever software you're working on. If you, like I use GameMaker, so I always am in close contact with the uh, GameMaker folks. Um, reach out to them and become known because they have these things. Like if you become known to the at t they're like, Psst, we're doing a promotion next month. Uh, apply for this thing, get ready, we're gonna do it. You know, you wanna be friendly with all these people. It's just good business. Um, uh, this is called daily deals. Steam does these deals where they're kind of invite only or you apply to them. This one's for this game time spinner. Um, Adam Kroll who runs Steam, this guy is Mr. Steam. Um, he tweeted about this. He just said, hey, you got to pitch to us, pitch your game to us. And if we like it and you give us enough time, we're probably going to feature your game. And it has to be a good game. And there's got to be reasons for it. But just explain to him, you got to work the system. You got to work the refs. Alden is the ref. And you got to buddy up to this guy. You got to know who this guy is, who the Steam team is. You have to be known by them. It's, it goes back and forth. Um, and this is the white glove. Like I say that Twitter is the white glove. Like indies spend way too much time thinking it's gonna do something, but it's just this white glove that's spinning around like inner sloth. Really the rabbit under the table is actually to use Twitter to build business relationships. Um, and I say this is your audience, understand your audience, that's what this talks about. Your audience is not those guys on the left, these super fans. A lot of people, a lot of indies go into Twitter trying to tweet, trying to get retweets, trying to get people to follow them thinking it's like these fans waiting for their game. That's not Twitter. Twitter really is the guys on the right, which is like, it's almost like a 24 hour convention. Twitter really should be treated that way where you're like trying to buddy up to business development, uh, people who are like, you know, deciding who goes into this booth called Sweden Games Festival. You wanna be the known by the people who are running these things. Um, these are just some people that like there, look at that Ben Schmidt right there in the bottom right corner. You want Ben Schmidt to know who you are. You want to be like friends with Ben Schmidt. Look at him. He's only got 253 followers. Ben, if you could be one of those 253 followers, you're in a good spot, right? Um, look for people on Twitter um, that have the, in their bio, they're considered scouts, platform managers, producers, developer relations, developer outreach. That should be your audience. You should tweet stuff that is very good to them. Those are the people you want to attract on Twitter. Um, these tags like screenshot Saturday, pitch your game. This is where um, they're not, fans don't really use screenshot Saturday or pitch your game. Nobody like, no just person goes, no regular person does this. The people who read those are those business development people, the people looking to like publish your game or get out there and, and, and ask you to join a conference uh, to be part of a festival or something. Um, these people, these biz dev people are looking for unique experiences, super high quality games, games popular on their platform, games they know will work. Um, they're hungry for good games. They really want to see good games. That's what they're there for. And trust me, I, I, I work for a publisher right now. I'll see, I, I browse Screenshot Saturday. Don't, I don't care about your, like, I'm not, I'm not one of those people, but I browse Screenshot Saturday just to see what the industry's up to. I guarantee it's amazing. If I see a really good game on Screenshot Saturday, by Monday in the Slack for this publisher, your game will be on there. I, I see it all the time. Like I'm looking I'm like, oh, that looks like a neat game. Sure enough, Monday morning, that game's in the Slack. They're talking about it. They're saying, this game looks neat. Let's reach out to them. <laughs> so I'm really amazed that if you're on Twitter, pushing out your game in these channels, publishers are looking at your game and like Nintendo's looking at your game. They really are looking at your game. So use it in the right way. Okay, so just go in that. Your audience is actually business people on Twitter. It's not fans. Twitter actually, and I've got a whole talk on this. You can look it up. I have a whole talk on how Twitter's not good for fans. It's actually good for business. So that's a whole other rant, white glove rant. Okay, so that's during development. So let's move on. Look at this. I spent way too long getting that arrow to work. So let's do post-launch. <clears throat> games nowadays aren't just um, you launch and then you're on to your next game. It's really about supporting it. And one of the things that a lot of people have after they launch their game, and maybe it did okay, it didn't do great, they wonder what fat features do I ask, uh, add to the game. And understanding your audience is key to this. So <clears throat> continuous development is the hot thing these days. Um, Among Us is very famous for it. You can't, you can barely see the things depending on how high resolution your screen is. That's kind of where Among Us launched. Imagine if you went a couple of months after it launched, you're like, 
you know what, guys, I think we're done with this game. Let's shut this game down. Imagine if they had, but they didn't. They kept going and eventually, like years later, it, it launched and, and exploded. So don't give up. Some games just take a long time of gestation. Another very interesting developer. I love developers that nobody talks about, um, but are really good. Like these guys, Trisade Brothers, you got to look at them. Look there on the right, this is their update page. They update almost religiously on weekly. They've updated 239 times on this game called Star Traders. They're on Steam. These guys are ma masters of this. They, they keep their game constantly updated and people love them for that. So th this is a really important factor in uh, running games nowadays. Okay, so you're asking, what do I do for my update? I don't know. I don't know, talk to your audience. Um, and I'm gonna show you how to do this. Uh, but they're gonna lie to you, not because they hate you, but just because they're fans, they don't know game development. So this is what you do. You, here's the trick. Don't ask them what they want, ask them what they've done in the past. That's a better way of figuring out what they actually want out of your game. And here, let me show you why. Okay, if you ask them, what do you want with our game? Everybody always says multiplayer. I don't know, but they think they want multiplayer all the time. And all their players like the hardest thing to add to your game. Like every fan that's out there, you're like, what do you, what should we add? They're like, multiplayer. Cause they don't, they don't know game development. They just don't know. So the way you get around and make sure that they actually want that is ask them, what was the last multiplayer game that you played with like PVP? And just shut that up and just hear what they say. And if they're like, well, since I had my kid, I don't really play multiplayer games anymore. You're like, oh really? When did you, what happened when you did play it? They're like, well, you know, it was years ago, it was my high school buddies. Uh, I had to schedule a day and I, I had to get time off and da, da, da. And you're like, hmm, sounds like you really don't play multiplayer games. And it's not that they, they're lying to you, it's just that they don't know any better. So watch out for that. Common questions that I ask to make sure that they really want this and not just saying this, like, were the last three games that you played or what was the last, you know, maybe if they're like, oh, I really like strategy games. And you're like, what was the last strategy game you played? You're like, oh, uh, it was like five years ago. And you're like, oh, sounds like you really don't want it. And then you say like, what did you like about that game in the past? Again, people are more honest about what they did in the past than what they want going forward. So that's just a, an interesting trick to figure out what people actually want. Um, careful with design committee. I kind of mentioned this before. If people say like, oh, I love characters with blue skin. Don't go to your design team and says, market research says people are, blue skin's hot right now. Uh, we got to make all our characters blue. Let your designers design. Don't try and use design research to, to fix that. So, um, but you know, it's all magic. Anyway, I just want to teach you if you understand your audience, you understand Steam, it's that rabbit underneath the table and it just makes it so much more powerful. So that's kind of the thing. Um, the other trick is I, I think a lot of people don't like marketing because they think it's coercion. You know, it's like you're tricking somebody like a used car salesman. Um, it's actually not that hard to really do it well. And it, the reason is you're not trying to convince somebody to buy something they wouldn't. What you're really doing is you're just looking to like show them something they really want. It's kind of like buying a gift for a person and they, they say like, that's exactly what I wanted. I've wanted that my entire life. I, you, how did you know me? You knew me so well. That's what you want to do with your audience is you want to find that perfect gift that they didn't know they wanted, but they actually love it. Um, you know you've done your job right when they say, this is what I've always been looking for. And that's, you're really finding the audience. You're not convincing somebody who wouldn't like your game to buy it. It's really finding the, the right people. Um, so that's it. I guess I split my halftime. I went a little fast on the end thing. So that's that's it. Um, here's my website. If you go to howtomarketagame.com slash free, you can actually join my mailing list. You'll get a free book. It's called Email Marketing for Video Games because I love email marketing, but it's tricky. So I wrote a book about how to do it and what to write to your audience. Uh, so I wrote that. Uh, so you can just go to that, howtomarketagame.com slash free, sign up, and I'll, you'll also get my weekly newsletter. Every week I come up with something to talk about um, and do that. So this is part two of the question phase. You can also email me. I, I, I'll just answer any question. I don't mind. Um, and that's my Twitter account um, that you can follow me on Twitter. I don't tweet pictures about my video games because that's not my audience. My audience is cool people. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. So that's it. Uh, questions? <laughs> Well, first, thanks so much. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, but okay, we got a few. Uh, Jason has another question. Uh, couldn't you argue that wish lists are just another white glove distraction uh, relative to true community engagement, sales, funnels, uh, funnel management, etc.? 
Um, the thing that I love about Wishlist is they're secretly email marketing. And number one fund Jason knows that I love email marketing. So the reason, here's the secret, <laughs> is the reason why Wishlist works so well is that Wishlist, when, when your game goes on sale for 20% or higher, for 20% off, everybody who wishlisted it gets an email from Steam that says that game that you wishlisted is on sale. And then it and it uh, gets in there, and then they can click the buy button, it goes through there. So it's actually secretly email marketing, Jason. Uh, as you know, I like that so much. No, the reason um, wish list is so important is it's all we've got. It's the best thing to <clears throat> to measure buyer's intent is wish list. That there's no other the steam is kind of weird that way. I know that you can wish list stuff on mobile, but I'm sure the noodle tape cake guys can explain it. But I don't think it matters as much as it does for Steam, just the way the algorithm for Steam works. Um, they just primed it around uh, wish list. And so that's just kind of how the magic of Steam works. Um, and regarding um, building your community, um, I've done some analysis. Well, there's this interesting thing, and it's not necessarily the same, but Kickstarter, they did some analysis where they looked at Kickstarters for all these different industries and they figured out what who were the backers. And for video games, it turns out in this Kickstarter, it's a little bit different than Steam, but not too much. For for Kickstarter, it's about 30% of the people who backed somebody were just randos who saw it on Kickstarter like, oh, this looks cool. I've never heard of this before. And they wishlisted it. A third of the backers were friends and family. And then a third was the community. So I kind of take that as like, we've never done anything. I don't think it's impossible to do on Steam. Um, but I kind of say it's like a third community, third randos, and third people who like wishlisted your game. Just top of my, that, don't quote me on that. That's just kind of like a, a gut feel that I have. So your co community accounts for about a third. Wishlist I, it's the same amount, but that's kind of my hand wavy of why I consider wishlist so important. It's just mostly the algorithm that we're slaves to. Makes sense. And like you said, you need you need enough, like some critical amount of wishlist before you will even be in some of the Steam promotional algorithms and stuff, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, there's no more questions here, but I have a few more questions. So okay, hit me. I'll be happy. Right on, Ben. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm wondering if you have any additional tips for like other platforms other than Steam. I know uh, someone asked about mobile, but even you know Epic or even the consoles, right? Uh, is there any additional tips that you have that that people should keep in mind? Um, I don't. I mean, to be totally honest, I don't do as much for. Um, I used to do mobile stuff, and I know that industry's changed a lot since I did mobile <clears throat> and I don't do consoles very much. So I'm, I'm just speaking out, out of lack of experience, but um, kind of to Jason's question, I do think building a community is good. You want what's called owned media, which is you want to reserve of people that if you say, go do this thing, they will go do it. They'll jump. And it's always good. That's like a very valuable asset that anybody can hold uh, any company can hold. So for both, um, um, uh, mobile game or for uh, console and Steam games, I know that building that audience is very key because you, you can do a lot when you have that. Um, the other thing is for both console and um, Steam, discounts are key. Um, I know it sounds weird. A lot of people are like against discounting their game too much. Carefully discount. Don't discount too deeply, but discounts are just how people interface with games. They look for sales. I did analysis and Nobody, I, I follow um, nine players for three months and I asked them to write down every single game they ever bought and why they decided to buy it. And not one for three months, those nine people, not a single one bought a game at full price. They just didn't. And it's just because there's so many games, you can get any game on sale. <laughs> like it's going to be there. It's, you could fight it. You could fight the system and say, I'm not going to do that. But it's kind of like you're playing hockey when the game is basketball. Like you're just playing the wrong sport. You, I'm sorry, but you got to discount your games to play this game. That's just how it is. Um, so that's one tip is don't be afraid of discounts. Okay. Uh, and that also extends into mobile. I can tell you if you are one of the few that make uh, paid mobile games, those discounts will be a big spike in sales. Uh, and you can use it for in-app purchases as well. Discounts work. Um, that's it. There's a question um, that has come in, uh, Chris, uh, from Michael. Uh, when you talk about objectives before release, for example, a 10K wish list, how does early access factor in 
And would you say these targets should be hit before EA release or before full release? <clears throat> For EA, um, I to be honest, I haven't done a game in EA. I haven't you know marketed a game in EA, but I do have a friend who did an EA game, and he he said the same thing. It's like basically, I don't know the magic number, but he said you want a lot of wish lists going into EA, um, and that's basically you get. You only get one launch, as they say, and when you do an EA launch, early access launch, that kind of counts as it. So if you go into EA with a low wish list count, you've kind of blown your launch. So you, you want to have that high number. Uh, so mm -hmm. you do, I would still say at least around 10,000 before your early access launch, just because you only get one. Cool. Uh, we got Michael Long asking, do you find having a demo available before launch to be important? Yes, yes, it's very important nowadays, and it's it's kind of it's kind of nothing's new anymore. Like back in the day, I remember playing Doom demo on an old three and a quarter inch floppy <laughs> like that. I did it was, that was like what you did for shareware games. So you always had to have a demo. It's hot again. It's awesome. So no, the reason demos are important are um, these festivals that I mentioned. They kind of run mm -hmm. on the on those demos. So like. Um, Digital Dragons, or Steam's doing a festival, which the application, if you haven't done it yet, is I think like December 2nd, you have to apply to be in this next uh, Steam Winter Festivals. Those are really good. You can get about a 500 to 600 wish lists if you do pretty well in these things, but you need a demo to participate. So demos are very good. Um, and they're kind of, they're uh, you have to make sure that you're doing a good call to action, make them about 30 minutes long, and make sure they say wishlist the game a whole bunch of times when they pull up the demo. You want to be very clear, wishlist, 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 join your mailing list, get them off of Steam and onto your community. Um, but I, I highly recommend demos, they're very good. Um, I have heard some people say that demos are bad once your game launches because people kind of get their fill from doing it. In other words, they'll say they try it out and they're like, nah, I got the, f I understand what this game is. I'm not going to buy it and they skip mm -hmm. it. So yeah. I've heard some people will actually right around launch turn off the demo. So there's no demo at launch. And then maybe like a couple months later, then add the demo because you know, you flatline for a little while after you launch the hype goes away. It's good to kind of like add that demo back in to spike it back up, but that's kind of the current strategy now for demos. Um, there's no more questions, but Ben, did you have another one there? I, I do have one more. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, so, you know, part of this was researching all of the, your, your different people on Steam, looking at the different reviews, looking at, you know, all the player feedback. And I was wondering if you had any tips for analyzing huge amounts of reviews or comments without just going through them one by one. Um, I know, for example, like at Noodle Cake, we, we for one of the games we're, we're getting, uh, we're creating right away, we got a bunch of player feedback and like going through it, you know, a lot of times people had bad ideas, whatever, uh, but we found it actually really useful to put it all in a word cloud and see what some of the main words that kept coming up. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you have any other tips like that. No, word clouds are great because, yeah, you see those words pop right out and you're like, oh, like skip on that game I talked about, the visual novel. You'd see skip or fast forward pop right out. That's perfect. Um, yeah, it's going through qualitative data is time consuming. Um, kind of similar to that. Sometimes I tag the stuff. So like in that spreadsheet where I just have all the stuff, I'll just tag mm -hmm. it if it's like uh, game length or something. Like you'll start to see the same thing kind of pop up. So I usually just have a column that just says, it's just like the tag and I just write up a quick tag of whatever that is. And then it's like a bucket. And then if we say, hey, what were people saying about the end boss? And then if I, then we can just filter by end boss and then you can see all the feedback for end boss or something. So um, that's one thing, but yeah, it just takes, it's super time consuming. Well, well gentlemen, I do not see any more questions, Chris and Ben's given a couple there. So I think what we'll do is there was no more questions. I'll do a quick closing here. Thank you, Chris, uh, for your uh, awesome insight and knowledge here. Uh, I know the audience uh, uh, really probably look forward to this discussion tonight. So well done, Chris. Appreciate that. Great. Thank uh, you. I'd also like to thank Ben for co-hosting with me tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. And Ryan in our uh, Regina office for keeping us running smoothly here. Uh, in addition, we are offering um, uh, for uh, one hour one-on-one -on -one mentor uh, mentoring sessions with Chris. Um, so if anyone is interested in the um, attendees tonight, 
uh, to explore some thoughts with Chris and have some questions for him in this uh, topic that Chris uh, uh, did tonight. There's an application process that um, we, we will ask you to uh, go through. Ryan has posted in the chat there, so can everyone please um, uh, take a look at uh, Ryan's got a, a link there for uh, the application process um, for us to um, uh, offer uh, some mentoring with uh, Chris in, um, in his knowledge and his expertise in this space. As you know, uh, this is a five-part webinar series in partnership with SASTEL, and next week's our final webinar. It's uh, our fifth one, and it's going to uh, the presentation is uh, on discoverability by design. Um, again, that that topic might say it all. Um, this session explores techniques to turn your game into a contagious commercial success. And that's uh, gonna be presented by one of our attendees tonight here, uh, Jason Delaroca. And is next Thursday, again, um, uh, seven to nine. So uh, if you're interested in uh, attending that session, again, Ryan has posted that into uh, the chat area. Uh, so please register. Um, that's our fifth and final webinar for this series uh, that we are hosting. Um, and looking forward to, to, uh, to that next week. Again, thank you very much, Chris. I uh, really appreciate your time, and uh, we really uh, uh, gained a lot of uh, net knowledge in your space. Uh, on that note, I'm going to uh, close off this evening. So everyone, I wish um, everyone a safe evening. And again, thanks, uh, Chris and uh, Ben and Ryan, and uh, look forward to everyone uh, attending next week. So take care out there. Bye, everybody.